Hello and welcome to another episode of Investing with IBD. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, and here we are at the summit of the stock market. We're kind of uh, going to be taking a look at the Mount Everest that is the stock market, taking a look at some of the peaks. Uh, we're going to be scaling those just like Edmund Hillary did so many years ago. Uh, and it's all about really not just, uh, in this case, taking in the view uh, necessarily, but taking in the signals that you can see that let you know, hey, we, we are at the peak here. Um, this week along your climb, we're going to be taking a look at some of the climax tops, some of the sell signals that you might come, uh, come across. Uh, and again, the Mount Everest of today's market. Markets. And helping me do that, as he does every week, is uh, my, my my little friend over here, Arusha Pierce. I was going to call you my Sherpa, but uh, you know, I don't think I could get you to hold my bags uh, at, no, at all. There's you know? no way. I'm the <laughs> there's there's no way. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm being at base camp. I'm not moving one more <laughs> foot up that. <laughs> exactly. Um, of course, Arusha is uh, the one of the portfolio managers over at O'Neill. Global Advisors. He's also an analyst there. Uh, also coming uh, coming on board with us today, we're welcoming back to the show, Eric Krull. He is one of the authors of The Life Cycle Trade and also a manager of a hedge fund, uh, EJK. And uh, yeah, he's he's got a lot of great studies that he's done on follow-through days, on markets, a big follower of Bill O'Neill, the founder of Investors Business Daily. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe he's our Edmund Hillary really here. Uh, and <laughs> And, and and I'm the Sherpa, uh, just carrying the bag. So uh, we're, we're we're glad to have you back, Eric. Uh, it's great to be here, Justin and Arusha. It's always a fun time to be with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you. Um, so let's get let's get started a little bit. Um, you know, I know that you have a lot of data in terms of um, follow through days and different markets. You're you're a big fan of history and you know, kind of getting uh, that sense of what is normal and different type of environments. Um, what What's kind of new on your on your list of things that you've been going over? Well, uh, thanks to Greg Morton at the uh, uh, Greenville, North Carolina IBD meetup group. They gave me all the data for the follow through days of the last nine years. I had been doing research on follow through days off and on since like 2009. And then I kind of lost track of some of the days when IBD would, uh, went to weekly because okay. I wasn't tracking them online as much as I were, but Greg, he uh, thankfully shared all his data with me. I was able. Eric, to you could have just asked. I have that stuff, yeah. man. I, I didn't realize you were you were scrambling for it. So <laughs> now, but, just, uh, you, you've advertised that to ask right, for anything. Right, exactly. The flood of emails but, come through. <laughs> so I updated my data, and uh, and now I was able to put together all the follow through days, really from 1949 through the uh, one that happened in November. And mm -hmm. uh, was able to uh, look at all the data and things. I thank God they didn't change very much. They they barely. I've redone the study three or four times, and it just moves the needle a little bit. But uh, it's consistent over time. The same thing can, seems to come through over and over. Mm -hmm. So uh, may, maybe we could show one of the slides to just to kind of give a sense. Um, you use some terminology, and I just want to make sure that folks are kind of familiar with, uh, you know, the way that you have different markets segmented. So could you go through that real quick? Sure. One of the things that happens is when you do research like this is you have to try to figure out uh, how would you classify rallies, you know, successful versus not successful. And in this case, um, I even went further and came up with uh, four different categorizations based on both time and also the gains that the indexes post. And when you do that, it, they come into four really nice categories. Uh, ones that last 15 days or less, I call whipsaws. It doesn't matter how much you gain or lose at that time. If it's 15 days or less, you're not going to have time to make great, good investment decisions. So we just call those whipsaws. And, mm -hmm. and so, Eric, if so get, after those 15 days or, you know, at that yeah, at the maximum 50 days, it's we're going back into a correction or going back to under pressure? Or how, how, how does that end with the whipsaws? I, I go with what IBD has called um, okay. the rally end date okay. uh, in a okay. correction. Yep. And so um, data before the IBD existed, I used some other parameters that we learned in market school and some of my own proprietary uh, things to, to make sure they line up really well. I, I went forward and checked them versus IBD's things and they, they line up really well. So, um, but I go by what IBD said, marketing correction, the rally's ending. And it had to be 15 days or less. Sometimes they ended up in just seven days or five days. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple instances in a couple days. So, mm -hmm. And it's an important point because a lot of times we talk about uh, you know, not every follow through day works. That's one of the big warnings that we give. But it's kind of interesting that, you know, so many of them that don't work, they tell you early 
hey, I'm, I'm, I'm no good. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's kind of like you 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 can smell them pretty quickly that you know this this one is maybe you know not not ripe. And there's a couple things that stand out that tell you which way it might be going, and it tells you pretty early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and uh, keep on going with your your segments. So then the uh, small losses or gains, those are uh, rallies that last uh, greater than 15 days. But by the time you get to the rally end date, and I measure the gain from the rally, the follow through day close until the rally end date close, if you have a 3% gain or less, that's what I call a small loss or gain or a slog. Mm -hmm. um, if you get something that lasts more than 15 days and you gain more than 3%, but less than or equal to 15%, I call those money makers. Now, mm -hmm. that doesn't sound like a lot for the index to move, uh, but and we'll see how much the index moves at the peak of those rallies. But when you're looking at the end date, it's already given back some. And individual stocks move a lot more than the index. So yeah. when you say, well, gee, from a 3% to 15%, how's that a money maker? Well, you, you can make money in those times. For sure. Uh, life yeah, changes are ones around. Those are usually around like two to three months, right, Eric? Like, I mean, those are, those are kind of like those small windows that I just remember where they'd open. You have to be pretty quick because they'll close pretty fast. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. Uh, and then life changer rallies are more than 15 days and you gain more than 15 percent in the indice by the rally end date. And 80 uh, percent of all rallies end uh, in 50 trading days or less. And so when I say mm -hmm. days, I'm talking trading days, not calendar days. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the next slide, it kind of shows how, you know, how many are kind of segmented into each of these. And I would say probably the most dangerous uh, again, the whipsaws kind of identify themselves pretty quickly and, you know, don't give you too much problem. But the slogs, those small losses and gains, those are the ones where you have to be very careful. You can get easily hurt because it's just, you know, things aren't working. You you, you take big gains, but then you quickly lose them. It leads to frustration. Um, all sorts of things can happen during those slog periods. Um, it's interesting that there's so many of them. Right. I mean, when you look at that, whipsaws are a little bit more than a quarter you know, of the time. It's like 26.5% of the time. And slogs are 41.3% of the time. And when you add those two together, that's about two thirds of the time. You don't really mm -hmm. have follow through days that produce money making opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, when you look but at I, money makers. It works perfectly though, Eric, because a lot of times, you know, we'll, 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 we'll all say that it's a third of the time during a year where you might have a rally and have an opportunity to make money in the markets the rest of the time either it's going down or you're just treading water exactly and that that fits exactly in line with that um and then when you have these money makers they're about 26 percent of the time uh, just slightly under what the whipsaws occur and then the life changes the ones we really want um those are only 6.3 percent of the time so you know you're looking at about a third of the time when you add a life changes of money makers those are times to make money and the mm -hmm. other two, you just have to be careful. So money management is key. Yeah. I, and I think that's that's really kind of the, the end result here is that whatever signal that you use, you got to realize that nothing is 100%. Uh, and that's where the risk management, money management comes into play because uh, it's it's all about, I mean, you, you, you watch those professional poker players that know when to put their chips in, know when, hey, this is better to kind of, you know, fold you know, fold a little bit more here. And remember, poker players fold a lot. You know, there's a lot of folding that they do, uh, you know, waiting for waiting for just the right hand. So the patience that's involved, the money management, the risk management, all those things are are really, you know, really key. I, okay, I agree. So let's get to the, oh, yeah, let's get to the next one, Eric, here. Um, just the setting expectations, just so we have that data, you know, so walk us through uh, how what the best way to set expectations are. Well, you, the best way is just have to think about it that and when I first started investing and I first found how to make money in stocks and I was really excited that this was not the uh, the version I had in the beginning. But I thought, gee, it said about 75 percent of the time there. These follow through days are um, signals that the market's going to be good. And the way you get to 75 percent is you have these 33 percent of the time you can make money. But then there's 41 percent of the time you have a window where you can get out safely. So that's how you get to 75. But you have to remember the expectation is only about a third of the time is it really going to be a chance to make money. So don't go plunging in. Don't make mm -hmm. the mistakes I did when I was first learning how to do this. I thought, oh, follow through day, it's going to work three quarters of the time. I'm plunging because it's going to work three quarters yeah. of the time. Who doesn't like those odds, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then you find out that that doesn't work so well. And so 
you have to kind of put the toe in the water, like you guys have always said, buy one or two stocks on a follow through day. If they start to work, add to those and maybe add a couple more stocks as the rally starts to gain legs. But there's no reason to plunge. There's no reason to go from 0% invested to 100% invested in two days. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just kind of continuing on, one of the things that I thought was interesting that you kind of um, did to, to add to your study is this idea of how how the action kind of plays out after a follow through day, the, the, the first 25 days. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what you found there? Um, well, I think we need the uh, another slide for that one Okay, right, um, right there. If, if you take all the rallies over the years and you average together the first 25 days and you average together only the days for the life changers, the money makers, the slogs and the whipsaws, this is the average price gain over time. And it's really fascinating when I first did this, I wasn't sure what was going to show up. I was hoping they would, you know, um, separate themselves like this, and they mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're looking at um, at the end of the first 25 days, you can see that the uh, you gain about um, what is that nine percent, um, something like that. Yeah, nine point nine. Yep. Yeah, nine. Yes, and then you get um, you know six point three or four percent on the money makers, and like two point two percent on the slogs. And the whipsaws obviously are, are losers, and that that was that's good to know because then you can plot when when a rally starts. If you ever printed this page out, you can just start on a just on a piece of paper plot out how's it going. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, pull up the next slide, you'll see we have that line for what happened after the November first follow through day, the most recent one that we're currently in this rally. Okay, so let's let's take a look again, just diving deeper a little bit and, you know, maybe segmenting out this first 25 days a little bit more. Um, so after the follow through day, you've got this, um, you know, first 20 to 25 days. And uh, what, what what is this slide showing us? And, and you know, I, certainly describe it as much as possible since, uh, you know, some of our folks are going to be listening to this um, and, and not seeing the video. But uh, go ahead and describe what's happening on this slide. Well, what I've always wanted to know was when a rally started was, is this going to be a good rally or not? Is this something mm -hmm. I should be adding more uh, in money invested or not? And I was trying to find ways that you can tell. And I was able to uh, discern a few things. I looked at volume. I looked at the gain on the follow through day. None of those things ended up mattering. But what really started to matter was how the market started acting. For instance, did you get more uh, professional accumulation right after the follow through day? Whipsaws. In the first 25 days, you only get one to two, you get 1.4 mm -hmm. follow through uh, accumulation days after the follow through day in the first 25 days. A small loss or gain, you may get five to six of them. Money makers, you get seven or so, and life changers, you get eight. So, what you're seeing is, is as the rally starts to go, if you're getting a lot of professional accumulation, it's looking more and more like a rally you can make money in. And, um, Eric, also, just uh, quickly just define uh, professional accumulation for everybody. You, you have to have a gain of more than 0.2% and heavier volume than the day before. Okay. Okay. If you have so, heavier volume so than the day before. It's essentially a distribution day. Well, see, right. if you have heavier volume than the day before and less than 0.2%, now you're looking at stalling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so so basically, the, the idea here is the more power, the more strength you get, the more volume you get behind the moves, the better it is for the market working. That's right. And especially if you get those uh, subsequent follow through days or those add on follow through days, mm -hmm. whipsaws rarely get them. Mm -hmm. Small losses or gains, you might get one. Money makers, you get two, maybe, you know, 20% of the time you get a third one. And life changers, you probably get two to three. And But the really key thing is to watch what is the index doing in terms of gains after the close of the follow through day. Mm -hmm. Because whipsaws end up with a loss, small losses or gains end up only 2%, money makers uh, 6.4% after 25 days, and life changes are up about 10% after 25 days. So you, you can really tell, like, is it working? You know, uh, duh. <laughs> it, you know, the, ones that are work, the ones that are working are the ones you should be adding money to. But right, right. That. And the, the other key thing is, and we'll get to that, is what happens if you get professional distribution. Yeah, so let's go to that slide. Uh, because yeah, there's a flip side to everything, right? The yin, the yin to the yang. That's right. And this is a really helpful one. I remember Chris Gessel showing this at one of the IBD seminars years ago. And then I was happy to see when I did my data that it pretty much lined up very well with that. Um, 
if you get a professional distribution day on day one um, or on day two or day three, it turns out that those end up being great predictors of having either a whipsaw or a slog, like almost 80% of the time. 77% of the time, if you get a distribution day on day one, day two, or day three, it ends up being an opportunity that you're not going to make very much money. And so that's key to watch. Now, there were a couple times, there were maybe six times in total where you had two days out of three had uh, professional distribution. I found none with three days in a row right after a follow through day. Mm -hmm. um, but as it turns out, if you start seeing instead of accumulation and instead you get distribution, that's a very key thing. Do not add a lot of cash into the market. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of times as as what you're showing here, uh, you know, if it happens early, it's telling you, OK, this is not the this is not the right market for you. Now, I will put in one caveat, because when when Chris Gessel initially came out with that uh, data and, and he presented it at one of the master's program level fours, uh, you know, years ago, uh, there, there was this, you know, B Bill O'Neill, uh, founder of investors, Business daily had a problem with, with his data because of one thing. There was one, one very important rally that had a distribution day the day after a follow through day. And he's like, well, what would you have done there? Just not participated at all. But to your point, Eric, I think, you know, sometimes it gets to be a little bit of a balancing. OK, if you have a negative, but then you've got five positives to kind of counterbalance that, uh, you know, what, what do you what do you do when you get, uh, you know, one of these negative things? Do you do you kind of use it that way that, oh, but there's all these positive things that are counterbalancing it? Or how do you handle that? To me, everything counts. If I get a distribution day on the day one or day two or day three after the follow through day. Um, I'm, I'm noting it and then keeping that in mind. Yeah. But if I start seeing more accumulation and more subsequent follow through days and the index is moving up, that you just say, OK, well, we had a distribution that can happen. It doesn't necessarily mean it kills it because we see that only 77 percent of the time does it end up being a non money maker. That means 23 percent of the time you can make money. So you just have to kind of balance it. No, nothing's 100 percent sure. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Uh, well, you know what? Let's go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we're going to apply some of these rules to the current market. And then in our third segment, we're going to look at how some of your indicators for specific stocks can help you catch peaks. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Paris, who joins me every week. He's an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager and Analyst. Uh, and of course, we have Eric Kroll as our special guest this week. Uh, and of course, Eric is one of the authors, co-authors of The Life Cycle Trade. Um, you know, a very interesting book uh, specifically about IPOs and a lot of great market studies there. And of course, he also runs his own hedge fund, EJK. Um, Eric, so in the last segment, we were talking about some of the research that you've done on the markets and follow through days. Uh, let's go ahead and apply that to the current market. Um, you know, of course, we had the follow through day uh, on November 1st, and we had kind of this, you know, three waves down, if you will. We had an August follow through day, quickly failed, didn't go anywhere. We had an October follow through day didn't go anywhere, quickly failed. And then November 1st, that was that was the one that was magic. So how are we tracking so far? Because I mean, certainly there was a lot of power in the NASDAQ uh, to start out. And it was really, I guess, you know, we have to address the breadth issues that we have. But uh, go, go ahead and let me let me hear your thoughts. Well, one of the things that I noticed quickly was we started getting subsequent follow through days. Yeah. And um, the, the subsequent follow through days were a big indicator, in my opinion. And also we started also we just had professional accumulation days right off right off the top. And that was a, a signal to me to start getting more aggressive, more aggressive than the follow through days that didn't work in August and September and October. Uh, we weren't getting the kind of market action that we were in, in November after the November 1st follow through day. So that was one of the things. And uh, I put together a chart that shows how that follow through day price gain compared to the uh, averages of all the different categories we just talked about. And if you can show that, it'll be a great thing to sh see that okay, one of the things I was watching was how was price acting versus the standard whipsaw, the slog, the moneymaker, or the life changer. 
And I think one of the times I came on IBD Live and I and you asked me, how does this rally look? I said, well, it's starting to look like a life changer. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, there's no guarantees, right? But it started to look like to me, uh, based on what I could see, that it was having the characteristics of a life-changing rally. And you could see it relatively early. And Eric, so w which slide was it? Slide six. Slide six. Oh, there we go. There you go. There you go. So you can see from that slide, the red line, that's the gains that showed up in the NASDAQ index post the follow through day on November 1st. And you can see very quickly it was tracking above the green life changer average over the last, you know, 50 years or so. That's so mm -hmm. interesting. Actually. And, and you know, maybe maybe kind of on the stronger end of the average yeah. of the life changers. Uh, that, which, right. right from the start. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had that. I mean, that, that's remarkable, actually. Um, mm -hmm. because yeah, it was, it was really surprising at how powerful out, out of the gate it was because we, at William O'Neill, we actually called the fall through date. We, on the second, cause we were waiting for 1.7 to call call it. And so it got 1.6 or something. Okay, we'll hold off. And then we, we called it the next day uh, and we just had fall through day after fall through day. And, and really, I mean, just a remarkable with the, the, the percentage change of how this was tracking higher because of what really was so powerful. But Eric, I mean, I think it also highlights another point and Justin mentioned it uh, uh, at the beginning of this segment, uh, you know, participation, the broadness of the rally. In these studies, it's not really taking into account any of that stuff, right? It's just keeping it very simple. It's like, hey, you know, you're having these accumulation days, you have the original fall through day, a number of other fall uh, accumulation days and fall through days. This is the time to set, uh, get aggressive versus, you know, the kind of the the participation, which we've all we've all been concerned about um, throughout most of the year. And, and you're right. So I'm only showing part of the whole picture. Right. <laughs> you, you have to look at individual stocks. We don't invest in indices. We invest in individual stocks. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty clear from the beginning that there were more stocks acting strong than had been in a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's so this this, you know, the, the way a person can use this is if they could look at this and start to see how is this rally going, it, it kind of gives you an idea of how much you should be investing, how aggressive should you be? Yeah. And, and I, I mean, Arusha has a long time used the analogy of, you know, look, if you're you know, if, if you're going shopping and the shelves are bare and there's nothing to buy, I mean, that tells you something, too. And I'm sure that a lot of those whipsaws and slogs it's probably a little bit harder to find merchandise. And then it's also, you know, once you do have stuff, they, they, they quickly fail, they roll over, failed breakouts um, and so on. And that's, that's what we were seeing a lot in 2022. There were a number of follow through days that we had, and some of them had some good, you know, kind of the, the bear market rallies where they were making a lot of uh, ground up, but they just didn't last. And so it was, it was a little tough to make, uh, too much progress before you kind of got the rug, um, you know, swiped out from under you. So talk about, can you talk about the pullbacks that you kind of expect? I mean, we kind of did have a little bit of a flat area that we had in December. Um, and then of course the start of the year was a little brutal. Um, you know, it, it came down pretty sharply. Um, and now we're, you know, here we are. It's February 21st when we're taping this. Um, we're going to have to talk about NVIDIA earnings uh, at some point because those those just came out. But we've had these, you know, kind of pullbacks that have been mostly contained by the 21-day moving average line. Um, what kind of expectation do you have for a, st a, a stock market that is still a life changer but has these pullbacks that you just have to kind of weather the storm and buckle down? It, uh, the, I guess the first thing I'd say is you have to be able to withstand a pullback to the 21 day exponential moving average that that's always going to happen. And then at some point before a rally ends, you usually get at least on a, even on a life changer, you go back to the 50 day moving average. And if mm -hmm. you can't uh, position yourself in the right way that you can handle either a 21 EMA touch or a 50 day moving average, then you're going to be in trouble. And they always happen and they always happen at the wrong time, right? Like just the last <laughs> three days, the last three days have been a pretty substantial pullback starting when yeah. SMCI uh, kind of blew up. Um, and then all the other stocks related to AI kind of mm -hmm. went down in sympathy. And if you had a lot of uh, money invested in those stocks alone, um, I've looked at I, earlier today, I think the NASDAQ was down only 3.6%. Maybe the S&P was down 3.3% from the peak. Um, but you can have been down a lot more than that. 
And that's because if you had the, some of the high flyers and yeah. they're coming back, only some of them only come back to the 21 EMA, but that was a big enough, uh, you know, uh, drop that you could have dropped easily 10% in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a, that's a very good reminder because sometimes it's easy for us to take a look at, um, you know, when we look at the past and we look at what some of the stocks look like and we look at, oh, you know, these pullbacks of the 50 day moving average line, it seems like, oh yeah, that's easy. You just, you know, you would just, just bought more shares or, you know, initiated a position when it's at the 50, but you kind of forget that, that's not happening in a vacuum that you have a lot of other stocks that are moving down. You're taking some hits. Uh, you're getting a little nervous. You know, maybe you've, you know, taken a 5%, 6% hit to your portfolio. And the last thing you start thinking of doing is, Oh, you know what? Let me, let me start looking for things to buy off the 50 day. Exactly. And you know, people forget that if a stock goes up 50% and then it corrects 25%, you don't have 25% of your gains left. You only have 12 and a half percent left. It's the, the math makes works against you. So uh -huh. it, you feel that you feel the heat, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so you, you, you did mention a little bit about some of the stocks, um, you know, going on. And so again, right now, maybe we, we take a look at NVIDIA. Um, this is one that has been certainly a leader for, for quite a while. I mean, 2000, you know, we were just talking about last week, Arusha and I, how, you know, 2016 was the first time we bought this stock and it's had leadership qualities for quite a long time now. And of course, I think a lot of people were looking at the earnings, um, you know, holding their breath a little bit, you know, do you, do you hold into earnings? Do you, um, do you hedge your position? Um, the expected move on this was 11%, uh, according to the option market, uh, coming into today. And right now, it looks like it's staying within that expected range. Um, when so much kind of rides on a single stock, uh, does that kind of make you change how you look at the market or how you position yourself? It does. Uh, NVIDIA has gotten so much uh, chatter and press and discussion all over the place. And I have a position in NVIDIA. So the question is, what do I do? I should I mention, I do a, have a position in that as well, before I forget. <laughs> and I had a lot of cushion. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. um, if it hadn't gotten so much chatter and hadn't been all over the news, I probably would have gone in without any hedging. But because of what it is and with the expected move, like you said, I did hedge. Um, mm -hmm. I bought some puts to make sure that I, you know, you want to sleep at night and you don't want to worry about um, what happens if it if it does what SMCI did the other day. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, it does change what I do. And uh, when there's so much, um, I guess, uh, excitement around one stock. Uh, that you have to be careful and, and watch out for the big move. Mm -hmm. Oh, Arusha, you're... Oh, so just there very quickly, uh, it looks like they beat on both top and bottom line. And uh, I think the, da the data center re uh, revenues were ahead of expectations too. And the, the conference call is currently going on, but NVIDIA is currently up 7.5%. Uh, trading at 725. So let, let's see how it opens up tomorrow. But um, finding support, it came right back down to the 21 day uh, earlier uh, today. And so uh, let's see if it can continue to hold that support and, and, and uh, maybe uh, slowly build maybe three weeks tight or, or some other kind of position to give us an opportunity to add more to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, one, one other thing, Eric. Okay, so um, we're... We're about 70, uh, 75 trading days into, into this rally from, you know, again, taking it from the November 1st follow through day. So how about, how about distance? You know, I mean, again, we've already kind of had the, the, the rules that would kind of qualify this as a, a life changer. You know, it, it, even if we stopped today and this was, this was it, this was as good as it gets. Um, but how, how do you know? whether or not you should be able to expect more from something. Well, one of the things that I've tracked over the years is how long rallies last. Mm -hmm. And 80% of them end in 50 trading days or less. Mm -hmm. And some go on beyond that, 20% of them do. Uh, but what that also means is you should be expecting by, you know, starting around now, some sort of correction. And some calendar timing comes into play too. After you have a very big year, and last year the indice NASDAQ was up 43, 44%. Um, people have to pay capital gains. And mm -hmm. if you invest a lot and you have a lot of stocks, 
Well, you don't have the kind of money that might be paying big capital gains sitting at a checking account. Typically, people have to sell stock. I've noticed that years after the year after a good gain, typically the market has what I call uh, a tax selling season where they sell off stocks uh, somewhere between March 15th and April 15th or 16th, whenever they file the taxes that year. And you have to kind of be prepared for that. So we're kind of getting a little long in the tooth with the rally. We're getting near that you know, seasonality with uh, a, a correction. So, you know, there's things to look at where you can say, maybe I should take my foot off the gas. If you're on margin, you can get off margin a little bit, or mm -hmm. you might start to hedge, you know, and it's always a good reason to take those stocks that have 20 to 30% gains. Like Bill always said, you should sell a lot of those at 20 to 30% gains. Otherwise, when you get a correction like we have the last three days, everything comes at you and you go down a lot. But if, you, if you've if you sold a few with 20 to 30 percent gains, you get that correction. You're, you're riding through it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And it's also funny because, you know, we just had um, Jeffrey Hirsch on a few weeks ago from the Stock Traders Almanac. And, you know, he talked about, OK, when you're in an election year, uh, yeah. first term president, uh, you know, what what the year t tends to look like. So there's a lot of things kind of dovetailing, um, you know, in terms of the distance that we had uh, in time, you know, uh, uh, you know, where we're at seasonality wise, uh, February tends to be a little bit weaker. Um, so yeah, a lot of that was was dovetailing. Um, before we get on to our next segment, where we're going to go through some more uh, charts uh, for individual stocks, anything to kind of put a bow on the, the the market thing any anything else that we really need to have our listeners kind of take away from this I, I think we saw in the last few weeks some stocks that made just tremendous gains like we haven't seen in years and and sometimes I, I say there's like once in a decade you'll see a stock that will go up like 50 percent uh, in a day after announcing earnings I think of rim back in like 2004. I think of Facebook on, uh, in 2013, and here we had uh, Meta doing it again. And then you might add in there uh, ARM Holdings and also um, Palantir and SMTI. When you see that many stocks doing these gains that are just outsized, that's a sign that things might be overheated and ready for a pause. I, I think it was the NASDAQ was up 14 out of 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. Should anybody, and then you have <laughs> outsized gains like that on some yeah. individual stocks. No one should be surprised that we get a little bit of a correction. Yeah. I mean, coming back to the 21 EMA as the NASDAQ has done, that's that's really garden variety correction. Mm -hmm. That should not be something people are afraid of, and we should be expecting it, especially around this time. Yeah, yeah and the NASDAQ ran right up to the key resistance ba uh, back in 2021 of 16,212. Right. So mm -hmm. ran up to that. So having a little bit of a normal pullback, taking some time off and building a new base around here wouldn't be a surprise. Right. I mean, so that could set up the nice platform to go through to an all time yeah. high. I mean, the S&P has done it. The Dow has done it. But obviously the Nasdaq has not reached an all time high yet, like you said. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of the stocks that we've been following very closely because of their leadership. So the question is, have we gotten to the peak for these leaders? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Paris, who joins me every week from O'Neill Global Advisors. He's a portfolio manager over there. And our special guest this week, of course, is Eric Kroll. He is one of the co-authors of the Lifecycle Trade. Uh, I think we've pretty much had almost all of the co-authors on the show at one point or another. Uh, and he's also a founder of EJK Growth Fund, uh, a hedge fund that he he runs. Um, and right now, what we're going to talk about is uh, a little bit of, look, we've, we've probably a lot of us have gotten tired of the winter weather, right? It's one of those things where, uh, at least here in California, we're getting all sorts of rain and everything like that. So uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna be climbing these peaks of Everest, you got to start recognizing the signs when things are getting a little bit more treacherous, and and of course you want to be recognizing when you're when you're at that peak. So uh, let's talk a little bit about these topping signs. Now, uh, of course, you know when I think of topping signs, I, I think of when I first started working at Investors Business Daily and hearing um, William O'Neill, the founder of Investors Business Daily, talk about these climax top signals um, and, 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 you know, some other ways in which you could sell into strength. And of course, for those of you that have the book, how to make money in stocks, the fourth edition, this is um, 
this is stuff that you can find in chapter 11 now in, in the new book. I think in uh, your book, if I'm not mistaken, it was probably chapter eight uh, or, or something <laughs> like that, uh, Eric. But yeah, it's, it's, it's now in chapter 11, so you can find it there. But uh, talk to us about your the things that you look for, Eric, when you're deciding, hey, have we have we truly come to a top here in, in some of these individual stocks? Well, the genesis of this rule was that sometimes you get in a stock that just starts to take off and run and go almost parabolic. And the idea is, of course, that you would like to sell either on the way up or near the peak as much as you can. So uh, me and the co-authors of Life Cycle Trade, Kathy Donnelly, Eve Bobach, and Kurt Dale, uh, we developed this Everest rule. And the Everest rule was designed uh, primarily to try to pick up the signals that Bill talked about in his books, uh, how to you know, make money in stocks, like you said, in chapter 11 of the most recent editions. And you start looking for things that you know are signals that you might be at a climax top. So you're looking at things like, um, what if you have the biggest volume day ever in a stock? What if you have the biggest point gain in the stock's history? What if you have um, multiple gap up, gaps up? What if you have um, multiple days up in a row? And so what we start tracking are things like, um, if the stock's already had a good run and you're up 25% or more uh, from the low in just um, 15 trading days or three weeks, that's one signal. If you have a gap up of more than 5% and uh, the gap closes intraday and the stock closes in the lower half, that looks like stalling. That's another signal. And uh, I should mention that you, you say the true range. So just I want you to describe range. that because that's yes. something that maybe not everyone is familiar with. Yeah, the true range, if you have a gap up from the yesterday's uh, close till today's open, um, you might look at a bar chart and see that the range is smaller than what the true range is. You have to measure the range that includes the gap. So mm -hmm. not just the, from the open, from the low to the high, but you also have to include the distance from yesterday's close till today's open. Yeah. And um, we also look for like how many days up in a row, how many days up out of the last 10 days? Uh, what if you have multiple open gaps? What if you have um, the, um, like the largest volume, maybe not today, but it was recently, like in the last 10 days. So we put together all these signals and then we add them all up. And if you get five or more, that sets a trigger that says you need a trailing stop now. It doesn't mean you sell now. It means you set up a trailing stop and the trailing stop goes back two days and you look at the lowest price of the last two days and that becomes your stop. You might go back only one day if now you get a gap of greater than or equal to 5% or more. And then you say, now I only go back one day because things are getting overheated. And if you get a day where it's the, um, it's the biggest price gain in the stock's history, then you say, you know what? I'm going to use today's low as my trailing stop. So the trailing stop gets adjusted based on what's happening. But the whole idea is you're trying to capture more of the big gains uh, that the stock is having. Mm -hmm. So you're being so you're being patient, sticking with your full position until you get five of these conditions and then you're putting it, putting the trailing stop. Exactly. And now the trailing stop, you have to decide yourself. How much do I sell? Do yeah. I yeah. sell? <laughs> yeah. That's always the trick, trailing? right? Right. right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I, we have some great uh, examples from recent uh, days, and we can take a look at some of those. Yeah, and start with SMCI, right? The the stock of the, the the month, the year. Yeah. And if you look at that, you can see um, I put a day in there where you could have bought on that breakout. And then I show where you actually get the five climax signals uh, occurring. And that's when the trailing stop goes in. And you can see that gray line that follows underneath price. That's the trailing stop line. And look how a lot of the move is contained by that trailing stop. So if you had sold right away, if you sold when you got that, you know, that day with five uh, signals, that would have been the wrong day. You would have let go of a lot of potential gains. And I learned that through studying a lot of stocks. So if you put in a trailing stop and it contains a lot of the move. And then you get that huge final day and you can see that it closes below the trailing stop line. And that's when you sell. Now, I had some SMCI. So what did I do? Well, I had sold some on the way up. Why? Because I don't, I mean, I believe what I did, but there's always, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I knew, I knew the stock was not going to go above 700. And of course it did. Of course. I was right yeah. for about 18 hours. Uh -huh. So I sold. Uh, <laughs> 
So I, I had sold like half my shares right under 700 and I was going to hold the rest until I got the climax top signal. And then when I saw that one day, it gapped up. It gapped up a lot. I wasn't going to wait till it gets to the low of that day. I sold some more uh, midday because um, mm -hmm. I've seen enough of these to know that it's probably going to keep falling. So, yeah. but at least I was clued in because I had that trailing stop line. I knew that the ever signal had triggered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were all on IBD Live when when it started to finally fill in that gap at the mm -hmm. top right above that 1,000. And I think we all knew at that point, uh-oh, you know, th yeah. this, this is probably not, especially with the volume so high too. And we were talking about like how monster, monstrous the volume was. Oh. Early morning was like over like, it was like 1,200%. Uh, at that point so yeah so sometimes you might not want to wait till the close if, if you've uh, done this enough or seen uh, seen enough of these you can start lightening up at least and, and and you pointed out two signals it had the biggest gain ever in points right. and it had the biggest volume ever those are two of the signals that bill talked about mm -hmm. and i mean again it had the uh, gosh how many days up in a row did it have and how many gaps up did it have and right. uh, now let's just Let's just go back a little bit um, because you have on this chart, you know, the, the the mark for January 9th as as the buy signal. And then the Everest signal is is not that far away. Right. It's 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 only a couple weeks later that you got that Everest signal. So, I mean, that just seems so early that you would be like, oh, this this could be the peak. Now, granted, it wasn't. And your rule of that trailing stop kept you in, but is it mm -hmm. is it very typical that you get that that signal early, and then it's just the trailing stop that's uh, you know keeping you in in that stock? Uh, yes and no. Sometimes it occurs right before the absolute peak, and other times it sometimes signal the beginning of a run. So mm -hmm. um, Eve pointed out to me, Eve and I were going through the charts one time, and she said, "Notice how, especially on recent IPOs, it actually signals strength." And so don't yeah. don't hold back. And that's how we came up with the whole idea of a trailing stop is so you don't you don't get yourself out and you can you can ride the wave. You can see as because two days back and really uh, fast moving stocks ends up being uh, enough to contain most of the time. And mm -hmm. you also have to decide, am I going to hold to the close or close, you know, sell right. day? <laughs> if some, you might see in some of the charts we're going to show that um, it hits the two-day trailing stop uh, intraday and then closes back above it. So you mm -hmm. have to see you know, how you handle it. In this case, as MCI, I wasn't going to wait till the end of the day at that top bar. Yeah, yeah, uh, again. And, and you mentioned this earlier, but um, how, do you, how do you kind of handle that, that selling part? Because we always say you don't have to sell all or nothing. You know, it can be in pieces. So you mentioned how you had the belief that, oh, I don't think this thing is going above 700. Um, mm -hmm. and, and and then it did. So how how were you handling that? Were you selling like in thirds, in quarters? Or do you just kind of say, especially with something that you get this much capital appreciation on? Because just by the nature of the capital appreciation, it becomes a much larger weight in your portfolio. And so, you know, 10% drop hits different you know when you've got such a big position so how do you handle that well in this case i sold half at mm -hmm. the 700 and with the idea i was going to hold uh, the rest until i get to a climax top and in this case i thought well if i get the um the reversal on that one day with the big bar i sold uh, another half of what i had left and i had already also bought some puts uh okay. the idea yeah. being that well let's see what happens i might want to hold this it, is this going to be like a taser now called Axon that's going to have a, the Twin Peaks mm -hmm. uh, or not? Um, mm -hmm. And then when I saw that it really wasn't going to, uh, it wasn't going to finish up even above, I thought, 900 that day, I sold the rest. So I was completely out of the stock and just held the puts for a few days. Mm -hmm. well, uh, let's go ahead and move on to ARM. Uh, now, you, you mentioned that you and Eve Bobak were having the discussion about IPOs and how, hey, do we have to kind of treat these different? So uh, talk to us a little bit about ARM and how this one this one played out. And this is a good one because this actually demonstrates what she was talking about, how the, the Everest signal was a signal of strength. This is early in the run. The stock had you know, mm -hmm. recently IPO'd and this is starting to move and you get some of those signals that add up to five or more and it says, oh, Everest signal put in a trailing stop. If you actually did put in the trailing stop, you can see on the chart where you would have got shaken out mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. before, you know, like three or four weeks before the big gains. 
Um, and then luckily for me, I know about the signals. I know I don't, it's a new IPO. It's too early. It's too early in the run to have a climax top. I mean, Bill would say that, you know, a stock has had uh, a long run already and right. then you get into climax action. This didn't have a long run. So that was the signal that don't obey the trailing stop rule. And luckily for me, I held on to my shares and then it did some of that. Um, and you can see near the top there, uh, Arm also had some climactic more signals after the peak. And that was a good place to unload a little bit. I did. I unloaded some, but I kept most mm -hmm. of the position because it's still a very new stock. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so Eric, I'm, I'm looking at this chart and I'm seeing, again, the average signal seemed like it was you know really early here but your trailing stop that gray line uh, in in november seems like there's quite a bit of distance it's, it, it doesn't seem like it's right there underneath the the second day back or the the the, the day before so what, what's going on with the trailing stop there well there's one more key feature of the trailing stop line and that's this you don't move up the trailing stop line until you hit a new high on the stock so after you can see that everest trigger signal that said, okay, put a trailing stop in. It went back two days. But the stop stays at the same part, at the same point, until the stock makes a new high. And when it makes a new high, you go back two days from the new high point. So that's why we could see that line going horizontal for a very long time. Yeah, it, well, yeah. it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that on SMCI because it kept making new highs almost every day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Like, yeah. So you had that 6492, uh, which almost kind of formed a little bit of a handle. And so so you're saying that, you know, until it kind of crossed that, which, you know, it, it did, it was almost like a, it was almost a breakout from the handle, but that's mm -hmm. where you start moving up the, the trailing right. stop. Right. Because you and have the, you have the Everest and now you have the new high. Right. And let's say arm had broken down in that long period. It would have triggered a sell. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, Hey, thanks for, thanks for making that clarification, Eric. I appreciate it. And, and, you know, just, just something to address because, because we have you and you, you wrote the life cycle trade. I, it's a little funny to me how, you know, we had such, such a paucity of uh, IPOs in, in 2022 after, you know, 2021 getting crazy with the SPACs, 2022, nothing. Now we've got, um, you know, a, a new batch of IPOs, but they, they feel a little different like arm holdings. I mean, I traded that in the nineties, you know, it's not like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like, Oh, I, I remember you, uh, and Birkenstocks, you know, right. you know, Arush and I were talking yeah. about, Hey, you know, I mean, we were wearing Birkenstocks in the nineties, uh, you know, and that was, you know, retro from the sixties. So right. like, d d does that seem a little, uh, uh, different to you that these IPOs are kind of, um, not, not your typical, like, Oh, let's, let's raise cash. Um, you know, and, and, and really go for our expansion. Um, it just, it just feels like so much of the cash raising is happening in the private equity side. Uh, is the IPO market different now? It is. I, I, you're bringing up some great points. If you think about, you know, like should the word initially even apply to <laughs> ARM, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it was there and then it came back. Um, and that uh, what's that other one? Can view or uh, K view? Yeah, that was the oh, oh yeah, of, yeah, that was a spinoff of J and J, right? Uh, you know, Johnson I'm thinking Johnson. The, the IPO market really got ice cold mm -hmm. after that uh, 2022, and last year there's a few more, but not many. I think and Kellogg's these, did a did like a spinoff kind of like that too. Um, you're right. Yeah, and, and so you're looking even this year it hasn't really unfrozen yet. Um, so it is different. Um, many of the companies like to stay private longer. And then when they do come out, most of the time, a lot of the run up in valuation has happened during the mm -hmm. private phase. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at a stock like ARM Holdings um, and, and Birkenstock, you're, you're looking at companies that have been around a while. It's almost hard to say that these are like new stocks. Um, I'm, treating <laughs> <Fresh> ARM, <blood. laughs> right, I'm treating ARM Holdings. Uh, we talk about like institutional advance phase and we talk about IPO advance phase. I'm treating this one like it's already institutional advance phase because yeah. it's been around a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. We got one more stock that you uh, brought up uh, for us uh, on the on the Everest signal. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at um, GCT. And uh, um, I think I even have the title around here, but it is GCT. Yeah, um, I, I knew what you meant, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but this is not a, I didn't play this stock at all. I was made aware of it from IBD Live. And it was fun to put the uh, a, a buy potential buy there and then put in the Everest rule. And you can see that this one did not uh, trigger the uh, trailing stop for a long time. 
So you can see, unlike ARM Holdings, which triggered it pretty early, and SMCI, which kind of triggered it somewhat early, this one didn't trigger it until you had all the ripe conditions somewhat more near the top. And so here's one where you say, well, how long before the top? Well, in this case, it was a short ride. And you can see the trailing stop line and a, a place where you might have been able to sell some and retain a lot of the profit. Mm -hmm. And one thing I should mention, um, so for, for those of you that are looking at the chart, um, you can kind of see uh, this, this this really bad reversal that it had on um, January 10th. It was right around 2645 was the peak there. And that's actually when we started talking about on IBD Live that, wow, this is something that was way extended. Uh, I think it was like 90% above its 50 day moving average line, which just, you, you just don't see that happen. Right. And so that reversal to us really kind of reeked of climactic action, but it just, it got support at the 21 day moving average line, the 21 EMA, and then kept going. It really was kind of a, a surprise. Uh, how often do you see stocks do that where it, it'll just kind of get some, you know, take a, take a little bit of a breather and then come out swinging again. You don't see it on, on every day on most stocks. You only see it on these super high flyers. I think when I think back, maybe Tilray might have done it, mm -hmm. um, Axon, now you know Taser, and a few others. But it, it's only the, the crazy ones <laughs> that do that, where <laughs> you know, where you get this big move and then it comes back and then it goes on again. People, mm -hmm. it's almost as if the market sucks you into thinking, oh, it's over, and then. The, the institutional money or the people who are really trading like piranhas on a feeding frenzy, they're the ones who push it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah. Um, well, Hey, you know, this has been a, a nice, a nice walk down memory lane uh, for, for some stocks that uh, we, we've just been seeing kind of go through this crazy action in the last couple of weeks. Um, again, a, a, a very interesting signal here. Um, and I, I, I like the term, the Everest. So again, you, you can count on Arusha and I to be your Sherpas anytime. <laughs> uh, Eric, it's a pleasure having you on again. Thanks so much for sharing your, sharing your knowledge and sharing your, uh, your studies with us. Oh, it was a pleasure to be here. And thanks for asking me to be on the show and uh, always enjoy talking with you guys. Awesome. Well, uh, that's going to wrap it up for us this week. Uh, do tune in next week. Uh, we've got uh, we got someone new for the show uh, this time around. Uh, Jay Woods. He's the chief global strategist over at Freedom Capital Markets, and he'll be discussing how mega cap earnings, which I'm mean, look, we just had Nvidia earnings uh, uh, coming out today, and you know, still looks like the stock is uh, you know reacting. Uh, reacting well to that. Uh, but Jay Woods is going to talk a little bit about how these mega cap earnings are setting the stage for the rest of the year. And uh, he'll be going over that next week. So we hope you join us for that. Thanks a lot for watching this time around. We'll see you next time. Bye bye now.